we. Okay. Hey, welcome everybody to our final, what was supposed to be in-person meeting of the year. Um, we've, we've had a really good year in a lot of ways, although it's been a challenge. Uh, I think we've uh, had an opportunity to try out the, the hybrid Zoom thing and, and you know, that brings its own unique uh, opportunities for errors and we appreciate everybody kind of working along with us on it. I um, think we've got a really good program tonight. Uh, we'll jump into it pretty quickly. Uh, before I do, I, wanted, I do wanna say a thank you to Gassers. They had a plumbing issue and uh, uh, Crystal talked to them and they were devastated that they couldn't hold the, the meeting for us uh, this time, but uh, we'll be back there. They've done a really nice job for us and they've done a really good uh, organization to uh, uh, hold meetings with. So. Uh, Fingers crossed that it is a cheap fix for them and I uh, hope they're back at it uh, pretty shortly. Uh, other thing I wanted to do, um, uh, two things is, uh, number one, if anybody's done any kind of stream work associated with TU, if anybody's done any teaching, done any veterans events or uh, helped out with any kids events or anything and you wanna get us your uh, hours spent at that. Um, we're getting ready to put together our annual report and those numbers make a difference. Those get reported up into the national and then the national uses those to help uh, um, help make the case for why what we do is important. And so uh, just feel free to shoot them to me or to uh, anybody else you know in the on the board and uh, we'd be happy to add you in. So uh, it uh, doesn't have to be a big deal. Quick email with a few hours would be a, a great help. Third thing we wanted to do here uh, was just sort of highlight the upcoming events and there's a lot going on. So tonight's our last again, uh, supposed to be in-person meeting. Um, coming up, there's a, uh, in May, there's the Southern Wisconsin TU work day. Um, and you can see that they'll be doing some uh, oak planting. Uh, May 18th, we're planning on a picnic in the evening. I think that's a Wednesday. Uh, time TBD, but you know somewhere five or six probably. Brats and uh, uh, if you want to bring a, a rod and, and uh, throw a fly in Coon Creek at the park, uh, that'd be great. So right at the Coon Creek Park there. Um, coming up uh, June 4th is busy. We've got the Tanner Creek Stream Days. And for people that haven't done that, it's really a great event. They do stream shocking and they show bugs and uh, we help kids learn to fish and there's free food and it's just a really nice event. And uh, we could use either volunteers or just people that wanna come out and see some of the stream work there. Uh, that same day is also the state council meeting. Uh, that's also really interesting often at the West Fork Sportsman's Club. So uh, if you wanna find out what kind of business the council's up to, uh, it's a great way to, to get up to speed. Um, also in June, we've got the, the Coon Creek Trout Fest. We'd be happy to have some volunteers to help with that. Uh, we dump a whole load of fish into Coon Creek there and uh, uh, bring a bunch of uh, spinning rods for the, the kids with uh, hooks and worms and bobbers and uh, uh, they catch big fish and have a great time. It's, uh, it's a ton of fun as well. And then a uh, uh, couple other things coming up. Uh, we've got the Youth Outdoor Fest in La Crosse. That's uh, also a lot of fun, very kid focused. We're one small booth out of dozens that are there. So all kinds of neat things going on. And then uh, in August, we're planning on doing a, another Stream Girl event. Uh, uh, the the Quees were integral to getting that started for us. And uh, it was a really neat thing last year. Uh, completely exhausting. We could absolutely use uh, volunteers to help out with it, but uh, uh, more to come on that. Watch the website and Facebook for that. Um, Crystal, did I miss anything? No, I think you did a fantastic job. Thank you. That's a miracle. So uh, in <laughs> that case, uh, it, if, unless there are questions, I'm going to hand it over to Crystal and she'll uh, uh, do a quick intro for Jason, whom I think most of us know uh, well, and we'll get started with the real meat of the, the program, and I'm going to stop sharing, so uh, okay. you can see uh, what they've got going on. Well, I'm glad you're all here tonight. 
Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Freund, who's not only the VP of Cooley Region Trout Unlimited, but he's also a biologist at the UW La Crosse. He has a BS degree in biology, an MS and a PhD in forest researches, resources, excuse me, science, wildlife, and fishing ecology, as well as management. So his talk tonight is going to include science, bugs, flies, and maybe we can get him to give us a few tips on fishing the driftless this spring. Welcome, Jason. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so I put a couple of links in the chat just so they're there. So Fred had used a calendar, so that is there. And then I had this website blog thing I started with COVID and been keeping up since COVID. Um, so if you're interested in checking out, some of this comes right from that. So I'll, I'll allude to a few of those posts about where things are. And if you want to send me an email, um, there's my email. And the other thing I'll just mention is since we have a fair number on here, especially Cooley Region folks, if you are interested in chainsaw training, um, let me know. We have approved to um, fund a number of people to do that. I think we have like four spots open yet. So if you want to learn to run a chainsaw safely and get FISTA certified, I have a, at least a few spots open. I've done it before. So I, once you do it once, you don't need to do it again. It's a lifetime thing. So um, that I think is kind of a cool opportunity. So anyway, um, I'm going to share screen and get started. Y'all can see that I assume? Okay, I see a head yep. nod. Okay, so I am a little biased here, but I don't think there's anything better than spring in the Driftless. This spring notwithstanding, this has been a crap show, but uh, we will eventually have nice days again. So ruined, spring break, we hit that 70 degree day on Wednesday in the middle of our spring break. I caught probably 50 fish in about two and a half hours and it was crazy. And I haven't had a day like that since that I've been, I haven't been able to get out since then. So um, anyway, um, here is the, uh, so a link to the blog. I know you probably can't link to it through your thing, but it's also in the chat. And then here are some of the posts that I kind of used to put some of this together and things about the hatches of the drift lists and flies that I like. Uh, kind of a cool, I don't know, I've got a lot of traction at one point in time, this idea about just how far the drift list has come, how degraded it was at one point in time. And I think that's kind of a big thing that a lot of us don't understand. And then the greatest fly that's ever been made, I think the CDC and elk, it is something I use an awful, awful lot. Um, so that's kind of what I have there. And then just kind of remind myself, the whole COVID thing is where this all kind of came from. Ah, uh, this whole blog thing, just a way to waste some time during COVID. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll talk a little bit about a bit of ecology, just a bit of background stuff. And so I don't know, I feel like I need to share a little ecology stuff since that's what I do. Talk a little bit about April. So this is the American Granum. Um, this is probably, I think, the best hatch that we have in the Driftless. I'll talk about that a little bit and a few others. Um, talk about May, where we start getting into the um, sulfurs. When So the ephemerellas uh, can be a really spectacular hatch, probably our best mayfly hatch, other than probably the blooming owls, which are a little bit more consistent. But the sulfurs tend to be a little heavier when you do get them. And then June, where we start kind of transitioning into the trustral fishing a little bit, but also we get a pretty good hydrocyte caddis. So the net spinning caddis, I'll talk a little bit about that they are hatching in um, middle end of May into, into June, and they can be really spectacular. Um, not huge numbers necessarily, but just good and consistent. And then of course, you can just put on the old purple hippie stomper and do just fine too. So you don't exactly have to match, but there's some fun in that too. So a couple of just places to look for information. Um, Trout Nut, I'll show you another image of that. It's a pretty cool website. Macroinvertebrates.org is a nice place to really kind of get into looking at what some of these things look like. Fox Valley to you has a really nice hatch chart. 
it's for central Wisconsin, but it works pretty well here. You may have to shift it a couple of days earlier, but for the most part, it works pretty well. And then northern Wisconsin, um, John Simonson has done a really nice job looking at the bugs. This, I think, mostly from the Namakagan in that area, but uh, has some really detailed stuff there. And then I think the trout nut site is a pretty good one. So I've used this a bunch and kind of just showing you on my two monitors that uh, being able to have it on one monitor and then look at some, make some stuff on the other. So this is um, just to talk a little stream ecology. This is kind of cool. This is the same stream, just really different places in it, but they're only maybe 200 yards apart at the most. So this really kind of tranquil, uh, slow run pool kind of area. And then this one I found last summer was really kind of cool where the two branches of it come together and the one is running north and south and it's crystal clear, hardly any algae on the rocks at all. The other running east west just gets really different sun. So you get really different conditions. And I'm also going to assume that if you get really hot summers that uh, that one of them, the east west is warming up a whole lot faster than the north south one does. So kind of something to keep in mind if we get some warm weather again, like we did early last year. Um, so this ecology is um, kind of like one of the things, this is like one of the fundamental fisheries paper in, in the stream stuff that I do. And what it really just thinking about is that, so big term movements are like moving to spawn, but that just happens once a year. But we have a lot of this movement between Fish is finding places to find refuge. And a lot of that is just getting out of current during floods, finding lower temperature places during the heat of summer, just finding places when you're not feeding where to where to hang out, right? So where to where to sit when you're not necessarily actively feeding. And then these different feeding habitats to talk a little bit about in different times of the year there's different places that fish are going to utilize a little bit more, at least the larger fish tend to, um, by accessing kind of different habitats. And that's what this whole model talks about, this idea of how movement is so important for fishes. And I'll get at that a little. So here's one going to Montana, especially they had tons of issues these past couple of years with warm temperatures and people looking about where fishes have refuges so even though we have some fairly warm stream reaches, they have some places to get out of those and they may move into these headwater streams for short periods of time, even though they're not necessarily ideal for larger fish, but it's really important that they have a place to go so that when the waters do cool down in the main stem, they can drop back into that. And we see similar kind of things here in Wisconsin. I think this is really cool. So Kirk Olson, who is our fisheries biologist, also his birthday today. Um, so he is, he was on Elk Creek. So they're just into Vernon County, sampled a fish in 2019 and late, so in October of 2019, so late in the year and recaptured it about a year and a half, almost two later in Warner Creek, over 30 miles away. So I think that's just kind of, a, kind of cool to think about how these fishes move through these systems in some cases and how, you know, this having lots of streams that are in good shape is really important. So they can make those sort of movements that they that they on occasion will do. Um, and one of the big things, so we're talking about refuge, winter is a really huge, uh, important one. So they tend to find deep water or sometimes moving up a little farther into some watersheds and finding where springs are coming in. So this is pretty low in a watershed. Um, so right, and I kind of talked about this, sometimes they move downstream and other times they're moving upstream. So kind of depending on where they can find low current velocities, so they don't have to spend much energy and hopefully finding relatively warm water. And as cold as we were in January this year, it was kind of cool driving around the coolies a little bit and looking at the places that were ice free versus those that had ice. Those would be the places to come back to in the in the winter and also in the middle of summer because it means that they have a lot of spring flow and that's why they're staying open. Um, and I also think it's kind of cool is that they also often use warm water streams. As a matter of fact, pretty much every year there are reports of people catching trout in the Mississippi River ice fishing. So they will move quite a bit into different places. Um, and they also find places when they're not feeding. So this is one of my favorite streams. Um, and just this little channel through here 
If there's actively feeding fish, this is where they'll be. Less active fish will be tucked way up into these weeds sometimes. So bottoms of deep pools are always good for fishes that are trying to get out of the current. Rocks, weeds, wood. Wood is always kind of a really good place. Um, this, you can also see a nice little bed of watercress. So there's certainly a nice little bit of cool water coming in, kind of gives it away. And then these lunker structures and some of the older places where we had put those in years ago, that the downstream ends of those can be a pretty good place for them to hang out and chill. And again, they may not be actively feeding, but they will still feed if you put the right fly in front of them. Um, we talk about foraging habitats in that diagram. So here's a really good example of kind of classic places to look. We have this faster water coming in and then this overhanging vegetation and kind of prime spot right along that, that left side. And also this current seam, you see this, they're gonna sit typically in that little bit slower water and intercept the food that's moving down the faster water. So those are always places I'm kind of looking for, looking for those seams between fast and slow, deep and shallow. Um, it's because current delivers food, but it also requires a lot of energy. So in this kind of location, these inside corners tend to be really good, especially the farther up you get sometimes, tend to be where the, the larger fish tend to hang out. Um, so these the slack water areas next to fast, Deep riffles and runs, you'd be surprised that a rock like maybe the size of a basketball or less provides one heck of a nice little cushion behind it. Also oftentimes in front of it, and they will sit in those places that look like the water is moving really fast. But if you actually measure the current velocity, it really slows down in some of those places and they're well worth hitting. And kind of the best is always where these pools, where the riffles enter them. So if you find really slow water, so that's more of a run, but more of if you find a pool where then it just gets really slack, those tend to be the kind of the best. Um, this one hasn't happened so much this year because we haven't had much sun, <laughs> but this is always kind of one of the toughest places to fish, but a lot of times you'll see some pretty decent fish, especially when we get a nice sunny day when it's been kind of cool as they'll warm up in that. Um, bottom because then they can digest a little bit faster and they can they can grow faster if you're a trout you're putting on an awful lot of weight in april may and june typically those are kind of the kind of the best months where there's food and good temperatures both and then i think the other really kind of cool important hatch that's going to happen here really soon is probably starting to happen a little bit is that the trout are starting to come out of the reds so this is a little a uh, little brown trout and um, certainly a lot of little brown trout are eaten by bigger brown trout. So always one to, always one to keep in mind. Um, Mid-April to me is usually when the fish start getting, looking up a little bit more. I know some people have been catching them on dry flies already. Some of the blueing olives have been going, but to me, the granum we'll talk about a little bit is kind of the, really the most significant hatch that we, that we have and it just kind of gets them going and they start looking up. So April, I talk about granums, the, the Hendrickson, so a mayfly we'll talk a little bit about. Don't see as many of those around here anymore. Um, the blooming olives, days like today are great examples of blooming olive days. Look for that kind of cloud cover and they tend to do really well in that. And we'll have blooming olives hatches from March, April, May, little bit in June, they kind of don't happen so much in in the end of June, July, and August, and then September, October, they become really important again, even the end of August sometimes. Um, so here's a granum, the Brachiocentrics. If you really want to get into granums and learn a lot about them, I will try to remember to post at some point in time on the Facebook page a, um, a talk that, um, that was that Tom Logger had done for Central Wisconsin. That was really, really fantastic and got in a ton of detail about the granums. But to me, the granums are really kind of the best hatch we have. Um, so they're case building, they use organic matter. So caddis either build a case, they are, they're free living in some cases, or they'll talk about the net spinning like the um, hydrocyte. So they have a couple of different ways in which their larvae live. Um, these guys build a little case. Um, a lot of places, this is the one that you hear about brachiocentrics as the Mother's Day caddis. Here we tend to get them, I would say, usually within a couple of days uh, 
April 15th, a couple of days either side of it, depending on the weather. This year, I've not really heard reports of them yet, so I'm guessing um, they're late, like everything seems to be this year. So catching these things will drift on the water for a good long time, makes them pretty vulnerable. So, um, so you have a decent bit of exposure to the fish because they don't get up and take off right away. That's kind of what makes the bluings out, bluing olives off in a really good hatch too. The females, this is kind of cool. So they're going to dive underwater to lay their eggs. For me, I'm usually fishing brachiocentrics, the hatch from 10, 11, probably 11 is a better normal time to about two and then it kind of dies out a little bit but then later in the evening you'll get the the some of the females coming back to lay eggs so uh, a wet fly a um a winged wet a soft tackle something like that work really well for those for the adults number 16 18 is typically i'm fishing probably 18 more than anything i just use a cdc and elk i just i don't even make it black i I've been putting a little green butt on them, a little bit of floss stuff to do that. Um, but I don't even think that's really terribly necessary. They fish get pretty dumb when they start hatching. Um, kind of what used to be a really great hatch and we've kind of lost out for probably a number of reasons. Mostly they're really sensitive are the, the, the dark and light Hendrickson's. Um, so this is an ephemerella. We'll talk about another one of these here in a bit. Um, these are kind of mid late April. This always used to be kind of the hatch that we had between the seasons back when they had that week of closure before they opened up the, the frying pan season as some people call it. Um, really intolerant to pollution and they're declining in the drift list. I've not experienced a hatch in some time. So if you find one, let me know. They're, uh, they're pretty sensitive to organic pollution in particular and I think we're just seeing some changes that are happening with our bugs. And these are kind of one of the casualties of that, it seems. Um, and then blueing olives are the other kind of mayfly that we just, we're getting a bunch of right now. This is a, they're a hardy little mayfly. So these tons of the different species that we call blueing olives is kind of a generic term for not just even beta species, but even a couple others. Um, but I'm fishing more than anything a number 18. It's kind of like a, as a pretty reasonable size. They're not even necessarily all that olive. Overcast skies. So these guys, a little bit of drizzle, um, overcast skies. Basically the times that you don't find them are big, bright blue skies. Um, and then I think we probably overlook more than we should is that there's this huge hatch of trout fly, trout fry. We have, we have a ton of trout in our stream. So we have a ton, ton of these things coming out of their reds. Um, they're probably starting here really soon if they're not already some of them out. It'll last until about mid-May or so around here typically. Um, from there, they're gonna, so they're gonna start out as maybe, you know, three quarters of an inch or something like that, but they're gonna, you know, fairly quickly, they can put on a lot of growth in a short period of time in a, just a, a month or two they'll be three to four inches already. So um, look for them around the margins of streams. They can't handle the current so terribly well. So I tend to find them sort of in the margins of streams. And sometimes if you have really shallow water next to deeper water, you can kind of cast them in the shallow water, drag it into the deeper water. And that's where you often tend to get hit. Um, so this is the, uh, Milwaukee leech or semi seal leech tied in more of an olive. They sell those at the drift list and they look a lot like a little brown trout. I'm sure that's what they often get taken for. And I tend to switch from the black that I fish a bunch to this one kind of that time of the year. And then just playing around because they're kind of fun to, they're kind of fun to tie. So this is a European pattern, the magic minnow, but all kinds of tons and tons of different ways you can try to imitate little brown trout from you know little ones that are an inch or less to those that are you know a little bit bigger these are probably three inch flies um so um just looking at the chat real quick saw something in there the the granums are kind of the most significant one so i'm i put them as 14 16 here i would even go to 18 probably more than anything 
Um, some of the others though that we see are, oops, the hydrocyte. So we don't get them in the kind of numbers at once, but we get them, first of all, probably about a 14 is the most common size. And they just are a hatch that happens for a long period of time. Pretty much every single evening from middle of May through, or middle to end of May through middle to June, we get we get these hydrocytes, these spotted sedges, um, really, really abundant. Um, the little black caddis, the chamara can be really kind of cool. They're a really kind of a dainty, really thin little may or a little caddis fly. Um, look for them underside of vegetation. They can be like you'll just see this grass and has all these little black dots on it. They tend to probably run an 18, even a 20 most often. Um, and they can be really good. So um Don't ignore the riffles, not just the ones that you can euro nymph. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not a big euro nympher. Um, but little tiny rock places, all these little tiny places where you see a little bit of slacker water intermixed in this faster water are going to be places that fish are. And if they're sitting in a riffle, they're looking, they're there to feed. So back to that beginning thing, we talked about that whole dynamic landscape model. Tons and tons of productivity of bugs. They most of it happens in the riffles. So when fish are there, they're there to feed. It takes effort to get there. So they're gonna feed and then they're gonna drop back to somewhere safer. So I always hit these kind of places because it's where you're gonna find the most active and typically the dumbest fish because they're actively feeding. They're not as concerned about safety kind of during that time. Um, moving into May, so what I think of as May, the big things we have are the crane flies. So this is a coolie crane fly. And we get the, and we get the sulfurs. We get a bunch of caddis too, but um, our hatch diversity tends to be kind of the best in May. This coolie crane fly. So this is a pattern from Driftless Angler. You can tie all kinds of different things, but it's that kind of gangly look in legs. So in you know other places I talk about, like in the UK, it's a daddy long legs fly that imitates them. Um, we get the sulfur, the ephemerella dorothea, and maybe other species. The ephemerellas are kind of a mess taxonomically. Um, and we get the hydrocycles. So the those net spinning caddis, those kind of grayish caddis are really a great one. So there is, I was hoping Duke would be here. There's him catching a fish. Um, May is probably my favorite month. If I had to pick like in the drift list a time to fish and I got a month, it would be May 10 to June 10 would probably be kind of the, would be the time that I would try to get out as much as I can. So um, crane flies, this is what we tend to think of as a crane fly is the larvas that big, huge, you've maybe seen those before. There'll be an inch, almost two inches, inch and three quarters. Those aren't the ones that we're imitating. We're imitating much, much smaller. This is the, this is a tapula is the genus. These are the ones that you find around your house and somebody's like, oh, look at that huge mosquito or mosquito on steroids. It's not a mosquito, it's a crane fly. And they're kind of closely related, but, um, but not at all, this, not the same. Um, what's awesome about crane flies is they hatch really nice times of the day. Middle of the day, mid afternoon. Um, it's mostly the egg laying adults that we're imitating. So they will come back and lay their eggs. They tend to kind of crawl out. So we don't experience that kind of hatch so much, um, but we get a whole bunch of egg layers. And I wrote a post on this. If you're really interested in learning way more than you want to know about crane flies, because I did, um, most of them that we're imitating are in, are this Antocha, um, a bunch of different species. The um, Jeff Dimmick at the UW Stevens Point, uh, their entomology lab figures we have about 20 different genera. So that's a lot of different, a lot of different genera and probably even more species than that, that we're, that we're seeing as, as crane flies in streams. Um, and then here's just kind of an oversized um, soft tackle that is just an orange, oranges and yellows are usually what most of these crane flies are. 14, 16s, 18s, somewhere in there. 16 if I had one size to go with. Uh, this is a cool little fly, the brush hog. It is a simple little thing. This is kind of a version I tied with scraps. Um, 
but it's a so a nymph hook, a bead, get it down, black thread. Um, the tail, I don't put them on because the larvae don't have them on. So if I'm trying to imitate them more, if I'm trying to imitate cream fly more specifically, I don't bother. Um, and then a little hair's ear and mix in a little purple. I don't know why, but you can't kind of pick it on this one so much, but there's a little purple in there and that really seems to work. And then purple and black eye stub, and this is more black than purple, but there's something about that color on these that just really works. And here's a more recent version of what they sell at the fly shop, which is pretty similar, a little purple in it. Here it's got the tails and it looks like it's got a little CDC is kind of the collar, but a little light than dark and a little bit of purple. And for whatever reason, that tends to do it. Um, the sulfurs, so probably mostly Dorothea is what we have. Um, these can be a really, really good hatch. I don't think I've seen them in the numbers we used to. This used to be our best hatch, I think. Um, they've since declined in, in my experience, at least a little bit. Um, tends to be an evening hatch, right? So one of the common names for Dorothea's are um, pale evening duns. So they, a lot of times I'm fishing these from, so when we had those longest days of the year or, or near the longest days of the year, seeing light till 8.45 or so, I'm fishing from seven till nine, nine, you know, or something like that. Um, and my typically what I fish more than anything for those are sparkle duns as kind of a mix between an emerger and a dun. Um, kind of the, the nymphal shuck sticking on the on the dun is what I find best, but pheasant tails are great for those soft tackles. All there's a ton of different emerger patterns out there. I just have a thing for the sparkle dun. It's a great simple little fly. Um hydrocyte caddis, this is kind of the next big hatch. So kind of the 20th of June or so is when they typically will, or 20th of May, sorry, and then into June is typically when they start. We don't get huge numbers at once, but pretty much every single night at, as it's starting to get dark, you'll see some of these guys. You'll see some during the day too, but especially in the evening, you'll start seeing some caddis flies, usually around a 14, maybe a 16. I just fish a CDC and elk and I I have caught more fish on a CDC and elk than any other fly, and it's not even close. Um, and these, and also the granums, I probably should have mentioned it. Both of those, I am constantly just twitching the rod tip and making my fly move in little, an inch here and there. So not big, huge moves because they're little insects or relatively little insects, but these little jumps really seem to do it. And the hits are awesome. Um, there we go, move your fly. Um, and then we get the little black caddis, the chamara. So you can kind of see those guys on the streamside vegetation. Look, you know, um, so look for those usually kind of Mayish. Um, and this is what's really kind of cool about them is they have this larva that's just this really cool looking yellow larva. Um, so, you know. That can be kind of may a little yellowish pertagon or something like that can probably work really well. Just something simple, right? And these guys are going to hatch in pretty fast water. So a lot of the other things we find more kind of in a little bit deeper runs and things like that. Some of them are more associated with vegetation, like the sulfurs. Um, these guys you're going to find in really fast water. And then here's a last summer photo this is a cool little stream we did some work on by the way that um just look at that watercress and the whole walk there there was just a ton of it so i keep those things in mind when i'm looking for somewhere to go in the middle of summer um thinking about where i found a ton of watercress because i know i'm going to find nice cold water and brad or i can tell you where that are but you may have to buy us some beer or something um so sulfurs and crane flies are still kind of going into June. Um, hydrocykes are going a little stronger. Trestrels get to be a little bit more important. Um, and each year is different. So this was last summer. Um, early on, if you remember, early in June, we hit mid 90s for a good spell of days. We were a little dry there. And this was on the West Fork of the Kickapoo. We were hitting 73 degrees. So 
I'm looking for small water then and trying to find some places that are that are going to hold up to be a little bit colder. Um, other years, you don't have to worry about this at all. So this year is, who knows, maybe shaping up to be one of those that we don't have to worry about it so much. But I just a cheapo, I can't remember what I paid for this, 20 bucks or less digital thermometer I carry around with me. It's just kind of a great way to figure out where not to fish more than anything else. Um, I think, so as we're starting to move into terrestrials, I mean, you're fishing these earlier, but to me, like end-ish of May, last week in May into June, July, August is really kind of terrestrial time. And the Hippie Stopper by Andrew Grillos is just an awesome, easy little fly. Um, or buy them at the Driftless Angler. Um, but just works incredibly well. It's like, it's, it to me is a terrestrial just perfectly built for our streams. It's kind of a scaled down, not one of these big, you know, Chernobyl hoppers that are three inches long, but you know, something much more reasonable for our smaller streams. And this was him tying at the Bad Axe Country Club um, a couple years ago. And then this is a fly that I tie. This is kind of a takeoff on the Wendelberg Cricket. Um, just a simple little kind of, I just use some awesome possum dubbing, a little bit of turkey, although this one I can tell is one I tied with some web wing or whatever, wing, wing web stuff. Rubber legs are essential. Round rubber legs are better than any others that I found. And then just a little bit of foam to so you can see it better. This thing's gonna float really low. So this hippie stomper is gonna float through anything, even the fastest riffles and stuff like that. This guy is gonna be for much more like big slow pools and things like that. I do really well on that simple little fly. I call it a cricket. It probably is just as much a beetle as anything else. Um, so when it's really hot like it was last year, look for small water. So this is my friend, Mike. We're fishing a uh, well-known brook trout stream, let's just say, because um, it was pretty darn hot early last year. So this is where we, we found some refuge. Um, and then kind of last, to just to talk a little bit about where to fish. Um, so Kirk did this for me for something else. There are 7,386.22 miles of designated trout streams in the polygon that they have for the driftless area. So better way to put it, there's an awful, awful lot of driftless trout streams. Um, you, would, you will run out of time before you run into all of them. Um, so there's just a ton, a ton of places and you kind of look at the diversity. So here we are kind of the, um, what the West Fork watershed, the Kickapoo River watershed coming together, the Cooley systems over here, Mormon Cooley just above it, um, getting down into the bad axes, the north and south, all these, all these rivers that drain into the to the um so Richland County, the Pine and the the Willow and Bear and all of those. And then you get down south of the river. Um, I hardly ever make it south of the river anymore, I'll be honest, because why would I drive from lacrosse here all the way down here when if I drew a circle, I've got, you know, probably a couple thousand miles of stream. Um, so this was, I just did this for fun, did this on the um, Wisconsin Trout Tool, great resource if you've never used it. Um, you can find it on the DNR website if you just search Wisconsin DNR Trout Tool or something like that. But I started in Viroqua and I drew a line that was 30 miles and then figured out that you know in that area just look at how many streams if you're willing to drive 30 what i call crow miles so 30 miles as a crow flies from from Baroque, it gets you to iowa it gets you to minnesota and it covers an awful awful lot of uh the best streams in wisconsin so those are some of my favorite streams just to kind of share those with you and I think always kind of cool just to think about the flood effects and it's kind of cool that I like going to some of these streams that I knew really well and now they're incredibly different. So this is now, or was, I don't know what it even looks like now, but this was a junction of Timber Cooley and Rulins Cooley coming together. And this was after, um, I think, 2018 flood, if I remember correctly. So it's healed up from then. And then I think too, we are doing a bunch of work and are helping the DNR do a bunch of work. So they're spending a good bit of trout stream, trout stream, 
Trump stamp dollars. That's what I meant um, on restoration work. So this is Rulins. Oops. This is Rulins Cooley that we just donated about five thousand plus dollars of rock into, plus all the money that the Wisconsin DNR is putting into to deal with some of the erosion issues and some of these high banks and stuff like that. And then here is a finish. This is kind of a really heavily grazed pasture on Bohemian Valley that is really nicely holding fish. I have caught, I probably caught several hundred fish out of Bohemian last summer alone. Um, right, so here kind of soon to be new streams. So these kind of wide shallow places and some of these that are gonna get some work done in these next couple of years. And you'll be surprised how quickly the bugs come back. Bugs are really adaptable, really quick to, to recolonize. Um, so some of these places that the hatches have gone down a little bit, if we have some, some better water that they may come back even, you know, they may come back pretty strong. Um, getting a little crowded with COVID. So I always think this is kind of cool just to talk a little bit about and kind of where to find. So fish some places where others won't. That is my kind of rule of thumb. Like if you want to find solitude um don't drive along timber coolie on highway p and think you're going to find a place but go places where others aren't gonna go um small streams so move up to the headwaters a lot of people don't like fishing that stuff um some of the lesser known watershed so moving out of the west fork and timber coolie and moving into other places instead um I call roll casty water. So get in places that have tree cover and that are a little gnarly. A lot of people, a lot of fly anglers especially will totally ignore them because um, they're not necessarily easy, but they can be a fun challenge. And I don't do this as much as others. I know I just got my favorite thing to do, but um, find those places that are not eased get in the water, stay in the water, you know, access the water legally and stay in the water. And those places are often a little bit less fished or go and ask permission. There's a number of places I've asked permission and, and they're generally pretty friendly and allow you to go do that. You just need to ask. And I think, I don't know, summer in the Driftless is just spectacular. So these are a couple of shots from last summer. Um, I think last summer anyways, my friend Ben, we're out cooking, uh, deer heart kebabs after doing a little fishing or and then before going and doing some more fishing and my friend chris this was a great action shot that he just had a really nice fish on and uh the fish got off in it so you're sort of seeing the spring back of the of his bamboo rod after the fish got off so thanks for listening that was kind of my kind of my spiel for april may and june kind of went through that all, you know, fairly quickly, but I hopefully, you know, a little something new, I hope. And I am going to stop share. So thank you, Jason. Uh, do we have any questions or any comments or uh, anything we want to share? I have a question. This is Crystal. Yep. Um, you mentioned that there's been a decline in some of the species. Is that related to the neonicotinoids? I can never say it. Neo I, or don't we know yet? Neonicotinoids? Um, probably. Although I don't know that we can say that with any certainty. I think it's, you know, like so many environmental issues. It's, it's that. It is the water temperature, maybe. It is the, you know... It's, um, I think we have more organic pollution again than we had. I think we had a little spell where, so Wisconsin is one of the states that we have lost over 60% of our CRP land, Conservation Reserve Program land, because as commodity prices went up, people have paid more, you know, it, it pays to farm anywhere you can again, where before people were putting that into CRP because they were getting paid for it. And, um, so I think we're seeing some water quality declines and stuff because of some of the agriculture and things as well. And it's neonics, it's climate change, it's, you know, they all kind of, they all kind of act together, I think. Thank you. So, somewhere I know. Yep, go for it, Rick. Yeah, I just, I, I, you know, I would say maybe like 10 to 15 years ago, I was seeing a lot more of the Hendrickson hatches in Minnesota streams and Wisconsin streams. 
Yeah. I don't know if that's the case because I haven't been fishing them as much the past few years in April. But they're also they were also streams where there hadn't been many improvements on. And I, I wonder if there's something about the uh, the disruption to yeah. Yeah, it's possible. Although I I used to hit them on some streams that had that had improvements on them and they've just kind of I have not I've not really hit a Hendrickson hatch in God 15 years, I bet. Also, I was going to ask about your uh, uh, CDC and elk. Do you tie that with elk or deer hair? Deer hair. So there is a, um, I could probably find it real quick, but um, I did a post on it on the blog thing that it's, so first of all, it's Han Weilandsman fly. I just use it all the time, but uh, so he should get credit for that. Uh, a friend of mine from the Netherlands who came here, God, this was 1995. I, no, 97, sorry, 97 he came, and that was like, yeah, the week before I went away to grad school, and I was gone for the next nine years. No, awesome killer fly. Yep, deer hair. Um, as a matter of fact, ooh, I just got another nice piece of it. So okay, blue ribbon flies in West Yellowstone is, there is nowhere better to find really, really good deer hair for that. Yep. I use that fly all the time and I tie it with deer. And I was just wondering if you. Yeah. That's so that's what the original is deer hair as well. Hans's version. He just kind of the ode to the, to the elk hair caddis. So. Right. That's why it, yeah, that's why I got that name. So I thought it was interesting on your uh, fly size chart every month you had the uh, size going down by uh, the hook size going down by a, a couple there. I thought that was an interesting pattern. Yeah, we tend to get at least around here the some time. Yeah, the bigger bugs tend to be a little bit earlier, but not always. Um, and I would so that was something I did years and years ago. If I had that to do over again, I think I would have um, down sized most of those. I think those were, I think a lot of those that I had on there were on the, the larger size or the larger side of things. So how do you go about finding the, uh, these smaller streams uh, in the less well-known watersheds? What's your approach? I, so I just, I have not used it yet much, but I just started the, the five seven day thing to um what is that trout routes but honestly what i use most of the time is the regs book and the wisconsin trout tool that somebody linked earlier and just you know give it a try if it doesn't work it doesn't work but uh i think we just we are sometimes afraid to fail and sometimes we learn a whole lot by going somewhere that we don't know and maybe hit a home run maybe a strikeout but at least you took a swing at it. How, how deep are some of those smaller uh, streams like um, that would have fish in it? Oh, good question. So a lot of them are, you will still hit holes that are, you know, mid, like around here, I think if you find anything that's like mid thigh, that's deep and, you know, that's pretty deep in one of our streams. And if you're getting, um, even like fully knee high is totally deep enough to hold to hold trout. Um, if, if it just has a few places like that, I mean, that's deep enough for them to, to get away from predators pretty well and stuff. So. Okay. Thanks. Yep. I, I might mention that sometimes they say what it is, is the great blue heron is the worst predator of them. And they yep. can fish about three foot deep. So Ideally, the water is around three foot or deeper for a refuge, but, you know, they could be shallower. But getting back to what she's asking, you will often find these trout in, in five, six inch deep hole, little pockets in a, in a riffle or something, too. So you literally can fish right up in the riffles. I know one place I'm thinking of is about 10 inches wide and about two feet long and about six six seven inches of water in it and almost every time i go there i take a trout out of it and a good sized trout and i mean literally the 
the entire hole from like what you'd call the head to the pool is about three foot. And so there's almost no water in those fish you're laying in there. Hmm. That's, that, that surprises me. You know, I, I guess I haven't tried fishing those really small. I've seen them, those really small ones, and I always wonder about them, but I'll have to try that this year. You know, flick, flick a dry fly into them and you'd be yeah. surprised uh, sometimes. And, and sometimes it's right up into the riffles too. What you mm -hmm. think is, oh, I'm out of the riffles. I should be fishing down the hole. They're clear up in the riffles sometimes. You know, I think a lot of people walk by riffles and and it many, many times of the year it's a mistake. In the winter, they're not there, or at least typically not there. But by this time of the year, they're if they're eating, they're in the they're often in the riffles or as close to them as they can get. I might mention too, just as you come above the riffles and go out into the next hole, like Jason was saying. Well, sometimes those those fish are in just a few inches of water backed up right into the riffles in the tail of the pool. And you have to be careful. You walk right by it, and there's a whole ton of fish there. Yeah, if you look at the trout densities in our stream, there's most of them are sky high. You are <laughs> you are spooking a lot of fish anywhere you go. And I so try I don't I try to minimize it as much as you can, but you're it's kind of unavoidable around here. Well, Jason, as usual, you did a great job. We always enjoy hearing from you. Well, thanks. That was fun to put together. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Jason. I, I was going to say, I, I was laughing about the ripples thing because I can't tell you how many fish I've caught on my back cast where I'm just lifting <laughs> to do the back cast out of those ripples. And so I've gotten so I. I do a lot of short casts and, you know, a lot of uh, weak retrieves and, and uh, it makes me think I'm actually a fisher person. So uh, it makes me feel good about myself. So anybody else have anything else uh, for Jason? Yeah, Jason, what's your blog again? Is that the scientificangler.com? Scientific Fly Angler. It's, it's in the chat there a couple, uh, somewhere. Yeah, I yeah. think you made it up earlier there. I don't know if it's in the chat. You had some really nice art, you know, written pieces in there, Jason. It's been fantastic. It was funny. This last week, I wrote a post about um, bluegill sex. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just really kind of cool and interesting. And somebody must have put that on Facebook and it picked up. And it was, I had, I had thousand plus reads in the last two days on one post which was kind of funny so yeah it's yeah. in the chat i see it now Jason. yeah i just put it in there again i'm going to stop recording we can just chat instead yep. so. Uh, so thank you very much